Welcome to this introduction to CBCHB for hierarchical Bayes estimation for choice or conjoint experiments. HB has really empowered us because it's made CBC or conjoint modeling work much better because it improves the accuracy of predictions, it reduces the IIA, also known as the red bus, blue bus problems, and it allows us, importantly, to find products that appeal to heterogeneous customers which are with their heterogeneous tastes, which is so important in today's world where we have so many line extensions and different flavors that are out there to appeal to different smaller and smaller segments of the population. HB allows us to easily post hoc filter or slice and dice or segment our respondent data after we've um, finished estimating utilities. Now CBCHB is available in two ways from Santu Software. Number one is a standalone software tool called CBCHB and number two is integrated within the menus of Santu Software's CBC system under the SSI web platform. A standard CBC task would pre present different alternatives or concepts to respondents and ask them to choose one. For example, here we're asking respondents to choose among different vacations options. And if the respondent doesn't like any of the vacation options on this particular task, the respondent can choose none. I wouldn't choose any of these. We would repeat, for example, for 10 tasks for this particular respondent until we moved on to the next respondent. We set this up in terms of a list of attributes and levels. We could have different destinations, length of stays, and cost per person per day. I've got a simple three attribute with three levels each uh, design here, but the software can handle much, much larger problems. Now when you prepare your data file, if you've used Satu Software CBC system, you can simply export a text-only .cho file or the easier layout .csv file, comma separated files, which, which I'd recommend and I'm going to show you in a moment. You can prepare the CSV file by yourself by using SPSS Excel or just about any data processing software, so you don't need to have used Satu Software's tools to design the experiment and collect the data. You could have done that on your own and simply prepared the data file in a .csv format. Again, you could export this file automatically or you can create it on your own. I'm going to show you in Excel an example of what this file looks like. In the first row, uh, we have the labels for our columns A through G. Our first column is the case ID. This is respondent 1001 who's provided lots of rows and the respondent has provided different answers where a chosen concept is indicated by one and not chosen as zero. The first task has five concepts in it. So we index the concepts and we show for each concept what levels made up that concept for each attribute. The first concept was composed of all level threes of the attributes. The last concept is the none row and we indicate that as a vector of zeros. The second task comes along and we can see the five concepts for this particular respondent and this respondent's chosen concept number three in the second task, etc., etc. So what does CBCHB do to estimate utilities? Well, it does this balancing or compromise act between an upper level of the hierarchy and a lower level of the hierarchy. That's why we refer to it as hierarchical Bayes. We estimate parameters that fit an upper level model or an average model across the respondents. To do that, we're estimating population mean parameters referred to as the alpha vector. And we also estimate at the aggregate or at the population level a covariance matrix referred to as matrix D. The covariance matrix captures um, whether two levels tend to be liked together, such as red and the and sports coupe, for example, might have a high covariance. At the lower level of the hierarchy, we're estimating parameters or utilities or betas that fit each respondent's data well. That's called the lower level of the model, and hierarchical Bayes essentially creates a balancing act or a compromise act so that it gets good fit for the population parameters while also getting good fit for the individual level parameters. Often it's said that HB borrows information. And if a respondent has a lot of data and that respondent is really consistent in his or her answers, very little information tends to be borrowed from the population parameters. There's very low Bayesian shrinkage. But if a person has very little data, sparse data, and is inconsistent in the way that that person provides answers, maybe that person's just a sloppy respondent, 
Lots of information is going to be borrowed from the population parameters. In other words, this respondent is going to be shrunk or raked towards the middle of what the population looks like. So a sloppy respondent is going to turn out to look a lot like the average respondent, which tends to scrub the data and make sloppy respondents have a less negative impact on the results than other types of classical utility estimation that have been used in the past. HB performs a lot of iterations. In each iteration, we estimate the, the vector alpha, the population means, the covariance matrix, and importantly, the respondent utilities or the betas. We start typically with estimates of zero for the respondent uh, parameters, the alpha, and also the respondent utilities, the betas. And it typically takes thousands, 10,000 or more iterations until estimates of these uh, three vectors and uh, matrices, that they, 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 they converge. The convergence now doesn't mean that these uh, parameters stop changing once you hit that magic moment. It just means that they're going to oscillate randomly with no noticeable trend over thousands of iterations. Those oscillations can make for a lot of changes in the mean, in the mean utilities and the D, mat in the D matrix, but uh, over time we can average across those uh, final iterations after convergence has been achieved to be able to get very faithful and accurate estimations. Those are called the used iterations and typically the next several thousand, thousand iterations after convergence are used uh, as our final results. And we get draws and point estimates. Each iteration produces a candidate vector of beta for each respondent, what we call the draw for each uh, iteration for each respondent. And each respondent is going to have therefore a vector, a candidate vector of, of beta for each of hundreds or thousands of iterations. Now we would typically only use a, a few hundred or maybe up at most a thousand draws for each respondent where we would use each let's say tenth draw after convergence is assumed. Now the draws characterize the uncertainty around each respondent's betas. And this is very useful for academics and people who are hardcore into this because that allows them to do statistical testing at the individual level and to portray the uncertainty around each person's choices. Now practitioners often take a shortcut to simply average the draws across each respondent to produce a point estimate because it's a lot easier and faster to use these in cross tabs and market simulators and in cluster analysis for example. Now I'm going to show you how the software works. The HP software, you fire it up and you can and you get this menu system. And the first menu that you would uh, choose would be to select your data files. I've selected a .cho file, although you could also prepare the comma separated values file, and you simply would browse to that file on your hard drive or your network to open up um, that particular file, although I would say that the software works a lot faster and better locally rather than over a network. Once it reads in the data file, it'll take off the first, uh, the first row in the data set, the labels and it will uh, know that, th that the data have a particular structure of attributes and, and, and levels per attribute. I have six attributes in this particular study about uh, televisions. The software also picks up how many choice tasks are in the data set per respondent and we have 18 tasks here and I've decided to deselect the first task, throw it away as a warm-up task only. I can also choose settings the number of iterations that we want to uh, perform before assuming convergence, and then how many draws to use for each respondent. I'm going to use a thousand draws for each um, respondent in this case, and it's going to choose every fifth, uh, every fifth iteration to save the draws. So it's going to do 10,000 iterations and a thousand iter uh, draws after that, saving every fifth one, so a total of 15 thousand iterations, which is only going to take us a few minutes. When I'm ready to go, I go back to the Home tab and I click the Estimate Parameters Now button. And it builds an internal data set. I have a file from that I've used previously, but I'm not going to use those. I'm going to start from scratch to show you how it would start from scratch. The software reminds me how many 
respondents are in the data file so that I'm confident that I've got the right data file um, selected and how many tasks I'm going to use per respondent. And yeah, I'm confident that that's what we want to do. Then we start into estimation. Like I said, at first we, as we assume uh, that we don't have any information and the betas are zero. And so it starts out at zero, but very quickly, the, after just a few iterations, the betas start moving in the right direction to get good fit at the individual level and good fit at the population, um, at the population level of the hierarchy. At the population level, we assume a multinormal uh, distribution of the parameters. And that's an assumption that keeps everything well behaved, but it is not a restricting assumption that constrains the posterior estimates or the final utility estimates to conform to normality. If there's a bimodal distribution of preferences and it's strong enough and we have enough data, we're going to capture it in HB despite the assumptions of multivariate normality. Now, so this is uh, the history of our iterations, and the parameters seem to have stabilized. This green parameter is our best uh, utility, the highest utility in my data set. And you can see it's randomly oscillating with no uh, remaining trend, trend as, as well as the others in my data set. We also see for the current iteration some statistics, a fit statistic. This percent certainty is like a pseudo R squared that runs from 0 to 1. And this is a lot more stable to look at. This is the uh, exponential moving average, characterizes a lot of, uh, of iterations as they go by, so it doesn't jump around as much as this column. We also get summary measures of how much variance or heterogeneity we have across the population and the average magnitude of the parameters, um, and that's also a, a, an indicator of fit. We'd like these statistics to stay um, essentially oscillating around some mean over thousands of iterations. Anyway, the software is just going to finish uh, in a couple of minutes here, and then we're going to have our uh, parameters. So we're just about done. It only took a couple of minutes. And now it's saving the draws for the respondents. We have a thousand draws for each person. So that's going to create a rather large data set if we wanted to look at at it. But it's also going to collapse those draws and create a single average or point estimate for each um, per person, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Once we've finished, we click to close, and I can browse out to the same folder where my project was located to find a new file, a CSV file, that I can pop open in Excel with the same, uh, with the same name as my original data file. I've got that file and I've renamed it as results.xls, but that file has got one row per respondent where the utilities are shown. This is our vector of betas. This is the average of a thousand draws for the person and the average fit across the thousand draws for this person. We've rescaled to a zero to one thousand uh, point uh, indicator and this respondent fits 499, which is uh, is decent, not as good as this other respondent, uh, respondent number 11, who has a fit of 728. And of course, these are the important utilities for each respondent that we can cross-tab, we can analyze, and we can use in market simulators. Well, thank you very much to, for paying attention to this introduction, and I hope you have a good time with the software.